Awesome. Uh, thanks, everybody. Super happy to join. Uh, thank you, DJ Desired State, for rocking out. Uh, I want to take you everywhere with me now um, for all the interlude music. Um, my name is Jason Hansen, and I am a program manager uh, on, working on Azure Arc. And I'm also joined by Jonathan Innes uh, from the engineering team, who's going to dive in and uh, show us all, all the good stuff that we've been working on. Now, I want to first set a little context. Uh, so Azure Arc uh, was originally sort of born from a set of customer challenges. Um, the folks have lots of applications written in lots of different languages, different application runtimes, various deployment patterns. Uh, and those applications need to run in lots of different places. Uh, so that can include existing data centers, uh, hosting providers, branch offices, a server under Mary's desk at a remote location. Uh, the broadest definition of, of edge uh, and increasingly customers you know are, are using a, a multi-cloud approach as well whether or not they want to uh, use uh, capabilities from a specific cloud provider or they want to get close to uh, their customers using a specific vendor now customers are asking how can they operate in this uh, environment how can they ensure that they've got end-to-end -end security how can they keep their developers and operations teams productive uh, in this kind of environment and the suggestion here that ARC is positing is that Azure itself, and we built a number of tools, services, and capabilities that help Azure run Azure. And typically those tools and capabilities were limited to stuff that's running on Azure, provisioned uh, to Azure data centers. Now with Azure Arc, what we're doing is we're building a bridge to extend those services and capabilities to stuff that isn't in our data centers. So Mary's, the server under Mary's desk. Uh, Azure Arc helps you know, provide that connective tissue. Now in the limit, that means one consistent Azure platform that's Azure connected and can span to lots of different uh, different locations. And there are lots of different legs to the Arc strategy. Um, I can say, we'll save that for uh, another day. Let's get to Kubernetes uh, and why Flux is, is important uh, to, to Kubernetes in this context. Now Arc starts by enabling infrastructure. Uh, and again, that's building that bridge uh, to Azure. Now for Kubernetes, this means deploying an operator uh, into your cluster. That operator runs and securely connects uh, to Azure. That means you can see your Kubernetes clusters in the portal sitting right next to your AKS clusters, and we can start to unlock some Azure management services. Now, this means at the end of the day, one place for cluster inventory, one place to monitor, one place to establish policy and control access. And all of that can be done from Azure interfaces, APIs, SDKs. Uh, and additionally, we want to meet you where you are with your Kubernetes investments, uh, your distro of choice. So any CNCF conformant Kubernetes cluster can be attached uh, to Azure. Uh, and that's all great. Now, I've got a bunch of kube stuff all over the place. Uh, now I want to make sure that it's uh, configured consistently, uh, that I've got all the right namespaces, the right applications deployed, the right operators. And we needed a great tool to, to do that. And so we looked to the ecosystem, and this brings us really to Flux. So we've integrated Flux as part of the Azure platform. Uh, this means that you get all of the Flux goodness that you've seen today and will continue to see. Uh, integrated and Azure supported, and we use the upstream bits. You can use this, uh, this integration on any AKS or any Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes cluster. Now you can deploy Flux um, to those targets uh, using the Azure CLI, uh, by ARM template, by policy, or our APIs. Um, that gives you kind of an out-of-the-box um, uh, installation uh, experience uh, with upgrades and updates uh, as part of the platform. Now, because this is Azure integrated, this also means that we can start to unlock some of those additional Azure management services. And one of the things that I'm particularly excited about is Azure Policy, which allows you to author policies and have the Azure Policy Engine enforce that state across your infrastructure. So. For example, you can make a statement, any Kubernetes cluster that attaches to my Azure subscriptions or resource groups uh, needs to have Flux installed. And that Flux uh, should be configured to point to a specific set of Git, Git repositories. And the Azure machinery and the integration with Flux will make all of that happen. And your compliance or your governance folks can sit in the Azure policy dashboard and they can view and monitor uh, resource compliance across the board. And of course, with Azure, that's inclusive of our Kubernetes clusters, as well as any servers, virtual machines, and, and platform services. Um, and again, with direct integration into the Azure portal, we're hoping to make this as simple as possible. 
so with that context, um, I definitely want to go ahead and kick it over to Jonathan uh, to dig in and uh, show you this stuff in action. Jonathan? Thanks, Jason. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and get into the demo. Um, let's see. Let's pick the right screen. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. I would hope so. Can somebody just confirm just so I don't start? I don't see your screen yet. But now. Yes, it is coming up. Perfect. OK, I would have started presenting and there's nothing there. Um, great. So yeah, so I'm going to walk through a little bit of what Jason just covered. Um, the idea here is basically we're going to start talking about how you would go about onboarding um, Flux V2 and onboarding um, what we consider a configuration, which is a single source and kind of multiple customizations attached to that source, how you would go about configuring that on a single cluster in Azure, um, either a connected cluster, which is the ARC connected cluster or an AKS cluster. And then we'll also look at the at scale scenarios. So we'll take a look at um, a bicep template. Um, you could also feasibly use an ARM template to configure a uh, basically provision ton of clusters at once that all have uh, Flux installed. And then we'll take a look at the policy scenario as well, which will come very soon for Flux V2. And we currently have with Flux V1 and GA um, on in the portal. So here, um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a Git repository that we can uh, use for this example. And this is probably going to be one that's going to be repeated a few times today, um, which is the is a, the Flux 2 customized home example, which exists on GitHub and, and it's going to deploy the, the pod info application, which we kind of all know and love if we're familiar with GitOps. Um, and here we basically have two layers that we're trying to deploy. We have the infrastructure layer and the app layer. Um, in this particular case, I'm not actually pointing to the public version of this repository. I've, um, we're, we're showcasing the capability that we, we have, which is that um, we're enabling private repositories uh, to be able to connect <clears throat> to GitOps here. Um, because of course, you know most enterprise customers are using private repos to store all their manifests. Um, so here we've, we've actually have an on-prem Bitbucket server that we've provisioned, and um, we're also using this as a private repo as well. So there's, there's going to be, um, in this case, we're going to connect to this repository over SSH. So we're going to be using uh, a known host value for the public key as well as a private key to attach to this particular repository. So this is pretty much the, the high-level overview here. Um, and so for this example, we're actually going to show uh, the CLI right now. Um, and we, we have portal support coming very, very soon for this. Um, and, and just to point out, this, this Flux V2 feature right now is in, is in private preview and will be in public preview very, very soon. Um, so a lot of the support right now is um, we're, we're having portal support very soon. Um, but right now, most of the support right now is in the CLI and the APIs and the SDKs. So here we're going to onboard um, using the CLI. Um, so actually, the CLI that we used to onboard is this case configuration CLI. If you're familiar with Azure uh, GitOps at all, um, with Flux V1, it was AZ case configuration. And then you could dig in here, um, maybe doing AZ case configuration help and, and take a look at, um, you can do create, delete, list, and show commands. Now with this onboarding of the new Flux V2 offering, uh, we have this Flux subgroup here. So if we take a look at the AZ case configuration Flux help, correctly. We see the same offerings that we had with V1. We can create, delete, list, and show these Flux configurations that we're going to onboard to this cluster. And so here I've already actually uh, provisioned a uh, ARC connected cluster. And so if we take a look at the pods on this cluster, we see that um, we have all these Azure ARC pods that were deployed. Um, so this is done through the AZ connected Kates command um, that you would do if you were onboarding a connected cluster. Um, you obviously wouldn't have these, these agents here if you were using AKS. Um, this, this experience is consistent across ARC and AKS. So um, once you have connected to the Azure control plane, you can start enabling um, with this, this Flux V2 configuration. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy a command over that we're going to use uh, to provision this Flux configuration in Azure. Um, so here we've done uh, AZ Gates configuration Flux create. Um, we're attaching to the resource group GitOps days uh, to the cluster with the name GitOps days cluster, which exists within this resource group. And then we have uh, the name of the configuration that we're trying to provision, which is this private repo example name. And again, because this is a connected cluster, we specify the cluster type as connected clusters. And then here we see we can, <clears throat> we can actually specify uh, a scoping property. Um, so each configuration, this is consistent with V1 as well, each configuration that's created in Azure um, can either be specified at the cluster scope or at the namespace scope. Um, so here we want to give cluster-wide permission to, uh, to the controllers that are applying this, uh, this configuration, this source, and this, these customizations. 
So we'll give it cluster scope because we want it to be able to apply across. If we wanted it to just have access to a singular namespace, uh, which is the namespace that this configuration was deployed to, we would give it namespace scope permission. And then the namespace that we specify here is all that it would be able to deploy to. Um, here we give the URL of the Git repository that we're trying to connect to. So this is the SSH version of that URL. Um, and then the known host file and the private key file, as I mentioned, and then we specify some additional parameters that are, are part of the, the source spec and then some customization parameters that are also part of the customization spec. Um, here with the customizations, we see that we're applying two paths. Um, as I mentioned before, we have an infrastructure layer and an apps layer. And so we're deploying the two paths and we're specifying that uh, there's a dependency between paths. So um, again, we kind of get all the flux v2 goodness that we um, we expect that is, is the upgrade from v1. So if I go ahead and take this and copy it over to deploy, start deploying this thing to the cluster, we're going to see a couple of things. So first off, it's going to check if the flux extension is deployed on this cluster. And what we're doing here is we're actually leveraging uh, the extension platform that exists on Arc. Um, where we're doing essentially the equivalent of a flux install uh, to deploy the, the flux controllers to this cluster. So it's going to check to see if the flux controllers exist on this cluster. And since they don't, in this case, it's going to start deploying that. Um, and so in the background, while this is running, we can actually pull up another terminal and take a look here. So it's going to start to install the flux controllers and it may take a minute for them to come up. Um, so we'll take a second to take a look. I guess in the meantime, actually, I can go ahead and come over to the cluster on, in the portal and actually show you if we go to the extensions tab here um, for this cluster, we can see that this Flux extension is installing and is going to start to come up. Um, so we actually already see a provision here. Um, if we go back to the cluster and grab the pods, we see that the Flux system namespace has uh, some pods inside of it. And so here we see the, the, flux, uh, the flux controllers that we're used to seeing. We have the, the Helm controller, the customized controller, the notification controller, and the source controller that are, are coming up in this cluster. And then we also have a couple of flux uh, config agents that are coming up as well that are deployed as part of this um, extension install. And so here, these are two agents that basically bridge the connection between Azure and this cluster um, to be able to deploy the underlying flux objects to the cluster. So it's doing the creation of this extension. And then if we take a look here in a second, um, it should tell us that the extension has completed install. And then once that installation has completed, then it will then apply the configuration object, which is essentially the, the source object along with the customizations that it needs to deploy to the cluster. Um, so it's gonna have to round trip back to install the extension. Let's wait for that to happen. So here it says Microsoft.fox extension was successfully installed in the cluster. And then it's going to create the Fox configuration that we specified. Um, and again, this can take a few minutes for it to do the round trip. But here we see um, when we create a configuration for the first time on a cluster, we do the installation of the extension. Um, after you have installed the extension once, it's going to know that that extension is there. And so uh, subsequent installations of this configuration of configurations on your cluster won't cause it to have to go and install the extension again. So you only have one set of these controllers on your cluster, um, which is kind of the, the, the flux architecture for installing these controllers at a cluster wide scope. Um, if we take a look at the pods again, and wait for it to come up, it will take a minute. To bridge the connection. So here we see um, we're actually doing container creating on this pod info application. We're bringing up the ingress controller for Nginx, and then we'll also bring up the Redis backend in a second, um, which is here. So we have the Redis backend and the Nginx controllers are up, and then the pod info application is up and running. Um, the intention here was that we would install the Helm release objects that we wanted to install from the cluster. So if I get the Helm release objects on this cluster, we see that um, the reconciliation is uh, in progress and is succeeded for this pod info object and the Redis and Nginx are, are reconciling and, and successfully reconciling with this cluster. So we, we were able to successfully install the Flux controllers on this cluster 
um, and additionally connect them to the, uh, the Git repository that we'd intended to deploy these manifests to. Um, if we want to dig in under the hood and take a look at what we're actually deploying, um, here we can see that we've created a Git repository object that's connecting to this URL and has the name of the configuration that we applied. And then additionally, if we take a look at the customization objects, we see that we have two customizations that match up with uh, the items that we wanted to deploy as part of the ACK's configuration flux command. So now if we take a look, uh, we can actually take a look in the portal and see um, the GitOps information from a high level at the cluster level. Um, so here, if we take a look and click the GitOps tab on the side for this connected cluster, uh, we actually see the configuration name is here. And then we see a bunch of fields uh, at a high level here. So as you install configurations, you'd be able to see all your different configurations come to the side here. And at a high level, you can see that the operator state, which in this case is the uh, success of actually installing the configuration on the cluster is in a succeeded state. Um, so it was able to successfully provision the source and the customization objects to the cluster, um, as well as some like RBAC and, and secrets and things like that. And then additionally, we see that the sync status is in a compliant state. And this status is showing you that the manifests that you intended to apply to the cluster have successfully applied. Um, in this case, it's looking at, at Flux objects specifically. So all the Flux objects that you uh, applied, any of the customization objects that we created as part of the, the managed offering, um, it's going to, the customization is going to attempt to apply those uh, YAMLs underneath whatever path you specified. And then if it, it succeeds to apply that path, then it will um, show in a compliant state. So we can actually dig into the configuration here um, and get some more information. Um, we see again, the compliance state of this uh, configuration is compliant. Um, and the install state is succeeded. We also have the eight configuration objects that we're basing this compliant state off of. So if we dug in and looked at the configuration objects that I was referring to in the past, um, we can see all the kinds of these flux objects that we had applied um, or were inadvertently applied by the customization to this cluster. So these Helm releases and these Helm repositories that were applied. And we see they're all in a compliant state, um, which essentially means that they're in a, in a ready state on the cluster um, and have succeeded. So if any of these go into a non-compliant state, um, which would mean that they're not in a ready state anymore, we could take a look and um, eventually we'll be able to dig into the specifics of the conditions uh, on this object to see specifically why uh, things have failed to apply and what specifically is not, not applying successfully so we can remediate that. Um, and then additionally, if we want to take a, custom, take a look at the customizations that we applied through the managed offering, um, we can see the paths and the customization names and all the information that uh, we specified there. So that's the UI experience um, and how you can, uh, you can also configure alerting on these things. So again, if you see that uh, the compliance status, uh, the sync status is gone from compliant to non-compliant, you can have alerts fire based on that um, so you can remediate those issues as they come up. Um, so next we're gonna take a look, basically we've just shown what a, a single cluster offering might look like, but let's say you wanna automate a, uh, bunch of different clusters to deploy a bunch of different uh, instances of the Flux extension and deploy configurations to all those things at once. Um, you can do that through ARM templates now, as well as a bicep template, which is what I'm going to show you here. Um, I'm not going to deploy this bicep template because it, it take a little bit of time, but I'll show a high level overview of it. Um, essentially here, we're creating a managed cluster. So this is an AKS cluster in this case, instead of a connected cluster. And so here um, we've given a resource as managed cluster, we've given it, given it a name. Um, we uh, assign it an identity, which is, is required for this extension, uh, the extension platform to work on top of the managed cluster offering. But we, we assign it an identity, and then we give it some additional properties that are required for the AKS cluster. Additionally, we can then add a, the Flux extension, which is, again, the, the Flux controllers and the, the Flux config agent and, and things like that on top of this AKS cluster. So we specify another resource type, um, give it a name, and give it an identity, and then uh, specify the extension type, which this is the piece here that tells it uh, to install the Flux extension. So here we install the extension at the scope of the managed cluster and would install it on this managed cluster. And then finally, we can specify the configuration resource type, which should come after the extension resource type as it did in the CLI. And we give it a name, apply some properties to it. So here we, um, we have, again, the scoping property, namespace, source kind, um, the URL and other properties um, that are specified with it. And then that will apply. And we, we also tell it to depend on this extension object above. So it will apply this after the extension, which it should. 
Um, and so here we are applying the configuration object again at the managed cluster scope. So with this fairly simple bicep template, we could iterate through this template um, either through scripting or through the bicep template architecture itself to actually deploy a ton of different AKS clusters that all have Flux installed on them and all have a configuration that points to a single Git repository with as many customizations as we want. And we can, of course, deploy uh, any number of configurations to all these different clusters to kind of get, uh, again, that at scale experience that you would expect with the Azure Control Plane. Um, and so the last thing here is the policy scenario that uh, Jason laid out. So here, if we go over to policy, we can actually see how we can take it an, another step further beyond this ARM template, beyond this bicep template uh, idea, where we're actively monitoring whether these configurations are installed and whether the extension is in a healthy state. So here, um, this is a, a V1 policy that we're going to show. Uh, we don't yet have V2 policies, but that'll come very, very soon. So after um, it, over the next few months, when we do a public preview, um, we'll have the policy that will be offered there as well. So you'll be able to also do this with V2 deployments as well. But here uh, we have a V1 policy that we've created. Um, if we dig into this assignment here, um, which is assigned at a resource group level, um, we can see all the, the parameter details and all the information that's, that's part of this policy. Um, essentially here, we're saying that we wanna to connect to this repository URL. Um, and so, and, and all this information about the configuration resource type and, and things that are specific to Flux V1. Um, what this means is that whenever we deploy a, a new connected cluster to this resource group, um, which is specified at the policy scope, it's getting a little slow, um, which is specified at this policy scope, whenever we deploy a new connected cluster or whenever we first assign the policy and there are already connected clusters within that resource group, it's going to automatically check whether those resources are in a compliant state. And if they aren't, then it'll deploy um, the configuration to those clusters automatically. Um, additionally, it'll actively check uh, consistently over time whether those uh, are in a healthy state. So whether those resources are in a compliant state from the policy perspective. So if we go again back to the policy assignment and take a look at the compliance of this policy by clicking on view compliance. Just gonna give it a second to load. We can see that in this resource group, we have two compliant resources and one non-compliant resource. So here we can take a look at this non-compliant resource. We could essentially, we could click on this, go to the resource, or we could either see why it's not compliant um, if it doesn't have the configuration resource there, which is the case in, in this particular scenario. And then if it doesn't have the configuration resource there, um, which is the Flux V1 configuration, we can then uh, click this create remediation task, cause it to re-evaluate and redeploy things if they don't exist, and then bring it back into a compliant state. Um, if we go back to this level, oh, went a bit too far. If we go back to the compliance blade again, we can also see the resources that are in a compliant state. So looking at the resources that are in a compliant state, we can actually dig in to this particular resource and determine and check make, to make sure whether that resource, uh, whether that connected cluster resource actually has that Flux V1 configuration deployed to it. So again, if we take a look at this connected cluster, if we dig into the GitOps uh, wait here, it's taking a minute. we see that we've deployed this cluster config uh, Flux V1 resource to this connected cluster. So again, you can see how this is really powerful because we can provision a bunch of different clusters, we can uh, apply a policy to them, and then an at scale experience is basically we deploy all these configurations at once to this, these different clusters, and they're actively monitoring and alerting us when things are fall out of a compliant state um, and making sure that things are consistently in a compliant state. Um, so that's essentially what we're looking at going forward. We're looking at uh, offering this policy uh, at, very soon with the Flux V2 public preview offering. Um, we're planning to have the public preview offering of Flux V2 very soon over the next couple months. Um, we're currently in private preview. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me if uh, you're interested at all in that private preview and we can uh, try and get you set up with some of the docs that you might be interested in um, to be able to enable Flux V2 on either your connected clusters or your AKS clusters. Um, with that, if you have any questions, again, make sure to send them over in the Slack um, and Jason or I will help and reach out to you uh, to try and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um... I'm trying to look at the channel and see if any. Okay, so here's a question, um, if you guys don't mind answering. Uh, it, 
I think Tama was asking, like, she would be interested in what customers have been asking for for Azure and GitOps. Like, what use cases have y'all come across? I can go ahead and uh, take that. Uh, generally, you know, it's a lot of customers or customers that have a lot of different, you know, Kubernetes clusters. Um, one of the uh, customer case studies we pulled together was uh, Siemens Health and Ears. Now they've got uh, apps that they need to run in hospitals in lots of different locations. And so uh, they're using uh, GitOps and Azure to help manage that footprint. Uh, so that, you know, is based on Flux. They are they are writing Kubernetes applications. Um, the customers will provide kube clusters or they, they will deploy one uh, as part of their solution and then use Flux again to drive configurations uh, into those uh, environments. Um, also seeing you know a lot of interest in, in terms of this scenario for manufacturing uh, where apps need to run uh, on site uh, and of course they want to make sure that those applications are kept up to date um, and, and deployed securely. Um, uh, SKF is another uh, who's using a lot more of the, the Microsoft stack in terms of AKS and Azure Stack HCI and some of those other pieces, um, but uh, GitOps is a part of that uh, that solution as well. Awesome. Uh, I think I have another one coming through the chat. Does Azure Arc support AKS setup on developer's laptop? AKS setup on developer's laptop. A great question. Uh, not today. Um, with Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes, though, the, the min bar is you need to be a CNCF uh, conformant Kubernetes distro. So I, for example, do a lot of uh, uh, kind clusters um, that I'll spin up, and uh, enable them with Arc, uh, and then I can start to bring down again, you know, monitoring, I can bring down GitOps, I can bring down policy, security center, and defender, and a lot of this uh, Azure management services. Um, any use cases that have come up for machine learning and or machine learning ops? Uh, it's great. We actually have a first party service that is ARC enabled. Um, it's Azure ML and ML Studio. Uh, again, using ARC as the bridge, you can attach Kubernetes clusters into your ML uh, workspace and drive training and inferencing. Today, that stuff doesn't use GitOps under the covers, but again, you know, customers who want to use you know, GitOps techniques in terms of uh, desired state in, in source repos, it's something that the teams are, are looking at um, across the board uh, because we have done this, uh, this flux uh, work, for example. Very cool. Thank you guys very, very much. It was awesome hearing about this from you guys. Um, yeah. Oh, I guess we have another one. How compatible is this with Azure Stack Hub? Azure Stack Hub. Uh, so Azure Arc is not baked into Azure Stack Hub. Um, and for folks who, who don't know, Azure Stack Hub is a standalone pile of uh, infrastructure that provides Azure APIs uh, that you can you know, deploy to your own environment. Um, we are working on some longer term sort of convergence plans in terms of Arc to Hub. Um, but today, Azure Stack Hub has a standalone control plane that you can drive uh, cluster provisioning and management directly through Hub, and you don't need the Arc uh, component tree there today. Okay, awesome. I'll let you guys go. Thank you guys so much.